Hello and welcome to another 2000 AD themed edition of Life of Die. I'm your regular host Gordon and today I'm joined by fellow 2000 AD fanatic Alan. Hi Alan. Hi there, how are you doing Gordon? Not bad. Well, we're back for another edition of the Strontium Dog Audio Files and in this episode we're going to be talking general tactics and adding some notes about some rules which we think are even which we think are easily overlooked. Easy for me to say. <laughs> Everything discussed today equally applies to Warlord Games' Judge Dread Miniatures game because they're both the same gaming system, so it doesn't matter if you don't have Strontium Dog but you do have Judge Dread, this should be equally applicable. So let's get to it. Alan, anyone that's been following your campaign of the killing will know that you've played a lot of Strontium Dog. Aye, aye. So I thought it would be interesting to start this conversation by talking about the most basic aspects of the game, namely actions. I was wondering if you found yourself using some actions more than others, and if so, which ones? Well, every action has got basically its perks, but I feel that to the sprint double action, Mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's invaluable because you're basically getting the moving fast token on it, and um, giving you that basically means it's harder for you to get hit. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of the time that that has been really, really good for models basically to negotiate terrain as long as it's open. Uh, initially, in the early stages, uh, I was making mistakes, We mistakes where you can only do it if it's you're in open terrain. If you're crossing difficult terrain at any point, something I missed in the rules, and what that is, is it's terrain over an inch in height. You basically can't do it. Right. You can't perform that, and you can't, I'm pretty sure you can't perform a charge action either. But I'd missed that at first, and there was a segment early on in the swamps, which was basically was going across difficult terrain, and I'm sure that I missed that. I allowed my, my, one of my guys to sprint over a section of a bog, um, but in retrospect, shouldn't really have been allowed. But in a lot of the, the bouts I've been doing, which involved a lot of open terrain, like the, the kind of desert bouts, or even sprinting between two buildings, um, I found that that's been invaluable. And also... I very seldom use aim shot, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. because I'm f- I find that a lot of the time you're better performing two snapshots rather than one aim shot. Yeah, I've had yeah, yeah, I've had mixed feelings about that myself. It's an interesting one. So yep, I because the max wounds that you can inflict on a character is three wounds. So you might do a devastating aim shot damage, but regardless if you're doing five power and they've rolled no resist, you can't do five wounds in the one go to totally wipe someone out. Yeah, you, The most you can do is three. So you might shoot twice with snapshots and do three wounds each time and you can kill the person. But performing an aim shot, a lot of the time you're no guaranteed to kill a star character. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the intention of it, is, and that's the reason, because that was one of the rules I was going to mention later about it's easily overlooked that some people I know from reading on Facebook have, have applied five damage and injury markers taken down. I, I think the whole reason it's in there is to make sure that you basically can't one-shot a star character because they, they've killed four, or, four, at least four or five. And I think that's quite good because these these guys are the heroes. And let's face it, heroes never die in one shot. You never do in the comic. And I think it's equally right for the for the game to follow that kind of that history of the comic, if you like. I also think it makes them more worth the while. I mean, obviously, star characters are worth a bit extra as well, anyway, because of, they've got the star chip. But yeah, it makes if, if you were able to one shot them that easily, then it would be awful disheartening. Yeah, it would be disheartening, but you would also become more likely, I think to feel more of the kind of cheap, the basic characters, you know, ones that usually work even in ones in packs and things like that. Aye, because it's the strength of numbers. Yeah, exactly. So I I think it does give some balance to the game. And I know that there has been some people that feel that the judges die too easily in Judge Dread. So I'm wondering if that is a a possible reason that they're finding that their judges are getting one-shotted because they're forgetting that that it's a maximum of three injury markers. It doesn't matter how you could receive eight damage and it still will be three injury markers, that's it. So yeah, it's definitely a good rule to throw in there. One of the things, just when you're mentioning about sprint as well, the other thing I like doing with sprint is obviously, as you mentioned, you get a minus one to be hit from incoming shooting attacks. One of the things about cover in Strontium Dog and, and Judge Dread is you get a plus one to your resist if it's if there's intervening cover. Yep. And and if you're actually kind of touching it, you get a plus two to your resist. So my favourite tactic is to try and sprint and 
touch cover yes. <laughs> in the that move so that they I I did that myself any incoming fire they get a minus one to hit and they get a plus two to the resist so yeah that's a good way of protecting your uh, your characters that's a good tip yeah I agree with you about the snapshot and aim shot it depends I, I think the only time I might be tempted to use an aim shot is if it was somebody that was somebody that was down at shoot one and possibly because of injury markers shoot zero then you could use an, an aim shot to get your plus two dice aye yeah it's about the only occasion where i would tend to do it because i agree with you that it's better to try and get two lots of hits but yeah it's kind of swings and roundabouts that one i think but i favor snapshot as well one of the best times where i felt it was invaluable was i think in bout 15 when clacton was going up against dumazel in the prison and both were injured and they were losing energy, and because both had weapons which were great for close range, I think they had the repeater function on both, because they'd been injured and they were at long range, they basically couldn't shoot at one another, <laughs> so the only thing they had to do was having the option to aim and put that extra two dice onto to actual two hitting rather than damage was invaluable, and there was a couple of times, I can't recall if Clacton actually downed Dumazel using that tactic but he certainly got a couple of hits on him but that was one of the tense games where um, people were I think, constantly healing their cell you know, using the hunker down to heal their cell because they had their med packs and stuff but um, the whole thing we using aim there I felt it was invaluable because at first I was thinking Clacton can't shoot here I'm thinking he's got to move to get in a um, range and if he moves out he's in the open and then I thought aim I can aim and he can still stay in cover and as you said he's getting, going to get a benefit of heavy cover if he stays where he is so why would you want to move out yeah so it was perfect tactic to use in that circumstance yeah hunker down's another one that's very handy I do actually quite like the fact as well that if you've received a, an injury marker you can't actually clear it completely you're always stuck with at least one and that means that the weaker models are always going to struggle so they can't get away with hunkering down, but certainly characters like Johnny Alpha and, and Wolf and Judges, if you're playing Judge Dread, the hunker down's very handy. But yeah, I always love having a med pack available on the, in the uh, equipment, if at all possible, to clear that, to negate that. Throw, you would only use that if you had a weapon you needed to do it. I don't use it very often. Fight and charge, the only time I would ever use charge would be if I wasn't close enough, I would then use your charge, but... Same as what we were talking about with snapshots versus uh, aimed fire. If I was close enough, I would just do a fight action twice rather than doing a, a charge action. I don't feel the benefits enough. So it's more a case of going to be, well, it's actually not within four centi- four inches rather because um, you can move three inches and as, as long as you're within an inch of the character, you're in close combat. So I would only use the charge if I was at least like four and a half inches away from the other one. Aye. Jump climb, self-explanatory, you're know, ever going to use that when you have to. Shake it off is one of those annoying actions that <laughs> you have to use if, you're, if you've been uh, pinned or stunned. And Aye, that's so, it's so annoying. At least with the pin, you get a kill test that you might get a chance to not use it. But it's a good reason to try. I, I suppose that would be an argument for using the uh, multiple weapons because you get more chance if you're using multiple weapons or use an aim shot by putting more dice into your roll to hit that you pin the character and there's a chance that they, they uh, might have to use Shake It Off um, if they fail a kill test when they come to activate. Overwatch, I think, is very handy. I particularly like it for the characters that aren't star chip characters because I feel, you know, it's much more of a an issue, really, that they if they can't see somebody, I, I would be inclined, and they thought that the person was going to come and attack them, I would be inclined to just stick them in Overwatch and let the star chip character come to them. That was another thing that I was actually doing wrong right at the very beginning. I was under the impression that if you put the characters, not just the Overwatch, um, like the sprint markers, when the turn, the next turn began, mm-hmm. all tokens were removed, which is not the case. It's when it goes back to that character's activation. That's when the tokens removed. So for me, Overwatch became even more important then because if you put a guy in Overwatch, you know you're basically going to be covering the zone um, I guess your focused front, isn't it? Yeah. Focused front arc. Yeah, it's, so it's like in a 90 degrees in front of you. So you're going to be covering that right through until it's your activation again. So if you're last activated, you're going to be able to cover all that ground in front of you during the activation of your enemies, which was a great tactic to employ. Exactly. So that kind of covers the actions. So 
Yeah, I think really the thing I would say, I think we're both in agreement about this, we both prefer snapshots and we both prefer fight actions to the, yep. the double action versions, basically. But yeah, everything's situational. Sometimes there will be reasons to use those other ones. It's good to have the options. <laughs> exactly. So moving on, I thought it was a couple of things which might be worth mentioning that both of us have forgotten in the past. So we'll start with one from you, Alan. Uh, multiple guns is something that I seldom use, but I find it has been really, really good with its characters with multiple arms, like Maeve and Arms. Yeah. Because you're getting a plus one for every extra gun, every extra limb, in that in this case, for every weapon that you're using. Yeah, sure. So um, I think with Maeve, you're getting a, a, a multiple of plus three, I think it is. I think, I think she's got four arms or something. <laughs> Aye. So it's like pl- up to a maximum of plus three, I think. But whereas, all right, your target will get a plus one resist, but it's only a plus one. It's not a plus one for every single weapon that's getting used. Exactly. So if you're firing from range, say you're in long range, and you're definitely wanting to hit a character, also with the possibility of pinning them, mm-hmm. it's a great tactic to use. Yeah. But generally, I would never use it where we see like two, a character using two guns. You know, I just feel that for that extra plus one to hit and your enemy's getting a plus one, potential resist I've personally felt that it's no really much use I've seldom if ever used it to be honest with you but it is a great one with multiple limbed characters yeah. it's brilliant for you that. definitely used it for me if I remember that in your battle report so Aye. yeah Aye. Uh, but I'm the same I feel the same way about it I don't like anything that increases the, the target's resist um, so that's the reason I tend to avoid it so Pinned. I just wanted to mention this in a hello Andy Chambers if you're listening um, thanks for cl- clearing this up for me because I had pinned rules slightly wrong. I always read it as it's your, the number of hits has to exceed the character's cool but it's actually the character's modified cool so in other words if Johnny Alpha's suffered a couple of injury markers then before I was rolling five dice I think. I could be wrong I might be getting this mixed up with Hunker Down it's been a wee while since I played Strontium Dog unfortunately cause, just because of a pandemic and things like that but yeah, it's modified kill. That's just to be clear in that one. No. And you were going to say about evade. Yeah, the evade. Uh, one thing that I was, we got cleared up. Thankfully, I think it was in the first audio, which was highlighted. I'm sure at that stage I hadn't read all the rules through everything through, and it'd been a while since I played it myself. But it's the plus one evade that everybody gets for evading a blast weapon. That's very important. Yeah. I definitely played that wrong with uh, Steel Creek who had no evade and I, I used a time trap, time trap. on him. And yeah. he, should have, he yeah. should have had his... I mean, okay, it's not a great chance. Even, we'll come to it later on about the probability of rolling things, but yeah, Steel Creek Aye. should have had a chance in, in that particular battle report that I did. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I found that it was brilliant for, obviously, time bombs because if you didn't have that rule, mm-hmm. there's loads of characters that haven't got evade. Even a lot of the, the good star chip guys having to go to evade so you've got to have a chance there's a slight chance even though it's not a lot but by giving you that plus one evade for uh, blast weapons it's excellent but what is good about it is you don't automatically evade it you can move up to three inches away from it yeah but sometimes depending on where your opponent decides to throw the bomb sometimes you might not be able to completely get out of the way <laughs> If it's, a, if it's a blast weapon, depending on what the actual range of that is. Also, it can mean that you're out in the open. So, But with something like a time bomb, it's imperative because time bomb's instant death. Yeah. Because basically you're getting put into space. So, But it's it's a good wee rule, which is highlighted early on at the start. But if something had happened, then you'd, you'd maybe just skipped over that wee bit. It's one of the things that you could overlook because you might just be bogged down just looking at the, the character stat card and forgetting that there is bonuses to that in certain circumstances. Um, and this is obviously one of the most important ones, which I, I, f- I felt that if I hadn't get that sorted right away, I would have been so angry with myself playing through the tournament because there's loads of instances where time bombs, time traps, grenades has been utilised. And I thankfully I've remembered to do that now. <laughs> no, that's good. And just to add to that, um, one thing that Andy Chambers also cleared up that uh, pal- Simon was asking about the other day, which was it says in the rules about you can use evade an evade result to escape from close combat. Yeah. You can also use that if as some say you're in close combat and another character shoots at you. If you evade that shot, you can move the three inches to 
not only evade the incoming fire, but actually escape the close combat. And it doesn't trigger the escape from close combat rule um, because Andy Chambers favours the, the rule of killing. Nothing's much cooler than you're in the middle of a, a fist fight. Somebody shoots you in the back and you dodge out the way and nobody gets a chance to, to hit you. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty cool. Personally, what I think it would be an extra cool part would be not only do you dodge out the way, but the enemy fire hits the guy you were fighting originally. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> but unfortunately, that, that doesn't happen. That might be a step too yeah, far. <laughs> it might be a wee house roll. <laughs> but that would be awesome. That's like something you could picture in one of the one of the great strips, to be honest with you, that situation happens. Absolutely. However, I digress. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention about the injury chart, maximum three injuries, but we've covered that. So I think yep. Gunfighter was the next thing you were wanting to... Yep, a gunfighter was something that I found uh, initially I was doing wrong and basically it was because it mentions that everything's simultaneous. Mm-hmm. I had a couple of guys involved in gunfighter and it was going back and forth, back and forth and I hadn't been taking the amendments to their stats for each round. So basically Andy cleared this up as well and basically it's like a character shoots, he hits, the character he's hit, his target has f- uh, either no evade or has failed to evade, you know, to roll a, a, a special they have then rolled a special in the resist. So regardless of the amount of wounds that they'll be taking, that damage won't be getting put on right away until they are able to, to shoot back using their full stats to shoot back, potentially hitting a target. If they then hit their target and they roll a special and they have the gunfighter skill, they can then shoot back, but everything's kind of paused there and the damage between both models is taken. Then we resume the gunfighter. So say that individual that was hit, the person who has actually started the entire thing, so they have managed to shoot back with a gunfighter. Say they were shoot four, they would be minus one to that if they've taken a wound, or minus two to that if they've taken two wounds, whatever. And so it would continue then. But initially I was doing it, it was like a character would shoot four, and I think there was like three rounds. In each round, people were taking damage, but I was still rolling the initial shoot four for this character and I think it was initial shoot three for the other character when in reality it shouldn't have been possible by particularly for the shoot three character because if he's taken three wounds he's basically his shoot has been slowly but surely chipped down so by the time he maybe got to round four he's got no shoot left because he's taken too many wounds but it was something it's something that comes up in one of the upcoming bouts and I've highlighted the explanation for it and when you see it actually down, it makes a lot of sense than what people might be getting out of me just trying to explain it here. <laughs> but it's one of the things that you've basically got to look at it in stages. Yeah. You know, resolve the first hit and any result, any result of gunfighter and returning hit, resolve that and then continue on if gunfighter has been triggered by the other character. So, but it's... It's a great moment, particularly in this bout that's coming up. It's a great, iconic Mexican standoff moment with two characters blasting away and they're blasting chunks off of one another. But I can understand how people get, get confused with it. But as I say, it's a great rule. Right. It's a great rule. Once you've got it, you go, ah, right, that, that's absolutely brilliant. And it makes perfect sense, to be honest with you. That they're slowly but surely getting worse because obviously they're taking hits, so they're accurate, even though it is happening over the course of seconds. Mm. You're still getting knocked off balance. And the realism aspect, the character would still be getting knocked off balance. So his aim would be getting spoiled. And then, obviously, the, his adrenaline would maybe be keeping him going to a certain degree. But that can only keep you going for a certain amount of time. You know, it's like you would be taking damage. Your body's losing durability. So you, you would that would affect your performance. Yeah. But um, as a game mechanic, it's a great, cool thing to have. I've used that more than actual brawler. I must admit, in Brawler, it's a... Uh, it kind of works the same way, yeah. Uh, it works exactly the same way, but it just maybe I've been playing with more characters with Gunfighter, so the opportunity has arisen more with using Gunfighter. But there's there's some really good moments coming up in the battle reports in which Gunfighter features, and also where there's one moment where a character's basically getting taken down, but he's got the opportunity to shoot back with Gunfighter and potentially take his killer with him. <laughs> but no spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> One little thing I'll just add to that is that we're really talking specifically not just about gunfighter but bullet time where basically two characters with a gunfighter are exchanging shots. The other thing just to mention as well which I easily forget about gunfighter is you can't trigger it if you're pinned and that includes 
from the incoming attack, even though they're kind of happening simultaneously. So that's a little thing just to kind of bear in mind because it's very easily forgotten. There's a mistake which also I made, which is another thing for players to bear in mind. See if you've got a character who has gunfighter and you think, you know what, I'm going to try and go for broke. A lot of the time it is not worth trying to go for broke because as you said there, if you are pinned by the going for broke, you can not utilise your gunfighter skill. So a lot of the time you're actually as well to just keep your chip on the board and hope that you can uh, at least retaliate to a character, um, particularly if your character's got high resist. You know, if your character is taking the potential has got high resist and a lot of wounds left, a lot of the time you're better. That's a better option for you. Just keep your chip on the board and uh, t- got hoping you can actually use gunfighter. Yes, but <laughs> yes, but um, <laughs> yes, you can avoid being pinned by going for broke. But on the other hand, if you leave it off and then the incoming shot is enough to pin you, then you can't. Your gunfighter won't activate regardless of what you roll in your evade and or resist. So that's just another little. Uh, <laughs> it makes it slightly. It makes it a hard decision. Actually, I find it quite. I uh, say, for example, the character who's shooting you has only got shoot three. Right, and she maybe, or even shoot two, and they've got a plus one for short range or whatever. Say, for example, the ma- the most that you can hit with is three dice, and say you have got an unmodified cool of four, their hit has got to be equal to your cool, so it's impossible for them to pin you for like a shot there. You see, if they're shooting, I so and but equally, that's not the case if you're facing somebody like two star players, like for example, like sticks going up against Johnny Alpha. Mm-hmm. There's a very real chance of you getting enough hits to pin a star character. So again, it is it, it swings and roundabouts. To be honest, with you. Just <laughs> yes. to... <laughs> particularly as the wins begin to mount as well, you can uh, you should then Aye. start thinking maybe I won't do that. But uh, yeah, Aye. it's it's there's that's one of the things I quite like about the system. There's actually quite a few kind of difficult decisions to make about what you're going to do and and what the chances are. Moving on from gunfighter, I was going to mention about fancy footwork. This is something I quite often forget is um, if you've got an evade stat, because some characters don't, as you mentioned, you can make a test when crossing difficult terrain and any hit results that you get allow you to negate the penalties for moving across difficult terrain. I think because I'm so used to some other different systems where it's like you move 50% over difficult terrain, and that is the case in general terms in Strontium Dog and Judge Dread, but I often forget that I can do that little that little roll and I've got a decent chance put it that way if I've got even Aye. one of it it's a 50-50 chance that you'll be able to negate that and move your, your normal distance but yes you're right no, no sprinting across it <laughs> so. Aye. I'd say I, earlier on I was sprinting doing things sprinting across it and, uh, and I'm like no I, I'm really quite angry with myself like, even <laughs> dense shrubs you know, no no things like bogs like if it was dense shrubs and, and the scenery you had on your board is over an inch that class is that's classed as it's quite clear when it says anything over an inch is classed as difficult terrain yep. so earlier on there's a few times I've been using that and ah, I shouldn't have really been, been doing that um, but it, the, the fancy footwork is one that I've seldom used though I think it comes up on about 18 I think it's used because <laughs> I remember to, to actually use it Um but it is, see, you've got a character with free evade and they could use that. There's a very, very good chance that they're going to not get that uh, penalty. So it's something to really do your best to remember it because it can really, really help you when you're playing. Absolutely. So armory cards for you? Armory cards. I love the armory cards. Chicanery cards as well, to be honest with you. Yeah. One of the things I... I'm... Sorry, one of the things I noticed about the armory cards and, and got wrong quite a lot was... The likes of, uh, oh, is it cartridge number four, Johnny Alpha's got? Uh, yeah, yeah. So one of the things I was doing, because you can only use aimed fire to use it, one of the things I was doing wrong was that I was giving myself the bonus, the plus two bonus either to shoot and to hit or adding to the damage. Um, and that's not the case at all. No. It's just you use you happen to use the aim shot, but you don't get the bonuses for it. So that's, that's something crucial you, you should bear in mind. Don't do what I did. Aye. <laughs> That's never really come up with me, and that's something that I pr- think I probably would have fell foul of as well, to be honest with you, because in the tournament, because I'm doing things slightly different for the set rules when it comes to the armory cards and chicanery cards, but I'm still following the cards to the letter, how they're supposed to be getting played. But what I would have potentially done with that is, you're saying you've got used aim fire. 
I would uh, I wouldn't have gave them the bonuses for the extra dice or extra dice to damage, but I would have maybe used it with Snapfire. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if you're using a number four cartridge or I think number three cartridge as well, you've got to use aim fire. So that's a two, it's a double action. Yeah. You basically got to use. Exactly. So it makes it more of a consideration as well. Yes. And and it's great. It's a great thing because Johnny only uses them very, very seldom. Yeah. And whenever you see it, he's standing out and he's like you, you see him like zeroing down the sights of the gun mm -hmm. it's not as if he's just snap firing away so it makes perfect sense and it's it's a devastating tool to have in your arsenal that you know the number four cartridge yeah particularly there's a there's a nice clump of enemy <laughs> enemy <laughs> units there I, yeah great to get probably the other reason you've not usually used them much is because obviously you're using johnny alpha a lot less than in normal yeah yeah aye. and he's not had the cartridge Armoury cards, I think, is what's aye. happened there. So, whereas when I'm playing it, I tend to try and have, even if I'm playing Outlaws, I always want Johnny Alpha to be on the table just because he's Johnny Alpha. Aye, it's Johnny Alpha, on it? It's aye. his trip, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he is Johnny M Dog. So, and obviously, the other, yeah, I suppose just picking up on what you were saying there, um, the cards do say on them, like use with like, aimed fire or use with throw or whatever it happens to be. Aye, so I mean, the main thing I suppose about the armory and chicanery cards, I mean, the chicanery cards can actually get played anytime. I will, it's in between actions. Um, it basically says it in the, sh the chicanery section. Right. There, there is some which state you can use them at any time. Aye, there, I think there are ones that say specifically, isn't it? I've got a feeling maybe some of the add on cards tell you can. I, I'm sure there's one that you use at the start of the turn or something like that, so. I using chicanery cards. Most chicanery cards can be played between activations. That is, after a model has it resolved its actions, but before the next chip is drawn, unless it's specified in the card. Yeah, a card cannot be used to interrupt an activation once it has begun, which is something that I was kind of falling foul of in the first. I'm sure I made a couple of errors in the first couple of bouts in my own tournament, but. Since I, I caught that, thankfully, because I reread everything through in between bouts, and I noticed that quite early because that's one that could actually be quite important yeah. to how things would turn out. Particularly because certain ones of the chicanery cards are so devastating with the effects of them. Yeah. And how I'm playing in my tournament is like it's basically like a character trait which continues with a character. If that character is lucky enough to survive through to for one bout or another they will start with the same chicanery card as what they had because it is a, it's basically like a, a quirk, a quirk that they've got. And some of them are far, far more beneficial than others. Yeah, definitely. Quite variable. Aye, so they're great. And also to mention as well that um, for Judge Dread players, chicanery cards are the big med cards. It's equivalent, basically. It's the same kind of thing. Chicanery is a bit more thematic for Strontium Dog, I would say. It's brilliant for Strontium Dog because it... And that's one of the things that I think I've said this before quite a few times. I love the fact that the original art is you now ties in with Fantastic. The, the effect of the of the actual you know, the game element of it of the card itself. So make sure that you're fully clued up about your arming and chicken in the cards before you start because that's aye, it's a must. It can be a bit aye, it can be a bit frustrating sometimes when you're uh, pulling out the rule books halfway through the session and going, well, what what does this do? Aye. <laughs> That kind of thing. So I've noticed in the initial setup, make sure that you're sitting down and you're reading, being aware um of all armory cards and chicanery cards and the effects of what the weapons or what the, the cards will basically do. It is very, very important because there's so many times if you don't do that, I've overlooked things personally and characters has died a couple of times and I thought, oh, if I'd have remembered that I had that card, that might not have been the case. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's really, really important to actually... Once you've set your table up, got all your models on the board, just make sure that you're going, going over their stats. Not just the chicanery and armory cards, their abilities is something that's very, very important. And obviously, de depending on the complexity of your game, that can be sometimes it's no mean feat to actually keep track of that because there's times that I've played with multiple star characters and I've, I've had to make sure that I'm basically following the, the rules to, to the letter because if they don't, you're going to short sell one of the fighters and it's not going to be very fair if you're conveniently forgetting that there are certain skills and or um, cards that they've got which could aid them and, you know, you're conveniently forgetting but you're not forgetting for the your favourite characters, you know, like Johnny Alpha or whatever. <laughs> so to have as fair a, as fair a battle as, as uh, possible, try and be aware of the skills and the cards that a character's got available to them. 
No, I, I agree with all of that. The one thing I would say that makes it slightly more important about the armory or, and or chicanery cards or big meg cards, whatever you're playing, is that if you get that wrong and you play that card against your opponent and then you go, oh, I thought it meant this, mm. then your opponent, when, when it, if it turns out that you can't use it for whatever reason, your opponent then knows you've got that card in your hands. So it's, it's yeah, it's not great for them to know that information. But anyway, that's... Yeah, armory cards, chicken cards, big med cards are brilliant. I love those. They they really tie the game into the the source material. And to me, they're the things that really make the system. Actually, you know, I like I like all the the rest of the the way the system works in general terms. But I do think it's those that really make them uniquely. This is a this is a two thousand D game, Aye. and it's Strontium Dog or it's Judge Dread or whatever. I was going to mention as well about going for broke. I wanted just to talk a little bit about this because, anyways. Characters with a starting cool of four or more are starship characters, and basically they're the ones they can do a cool test at the end of the activation if they want. They're not obliged to do it, by the way. That's something to note because uh, I think some people thought you had to to do it. When you go for broke, I thought it might be handy for people to know the percentage chances, <laughs> the probability of it. So if you've now the other thing to mention as well is that characters who are not star chip characters they can actually go for broke as well if you draw a star chip and put it on one of those characters you can do that you can put it on a you, know, you can put it in a guy with kill one if you wanted i wouldn't do it i would always want those characters who actually are the star chip characters to be getting those but there are situations where you might want to do it so i thought i'd just quickly give you the the stats now if you've only got a kill of one the chance of returning a star chip to the back is one in six, which is sixteen point six seven percent. So that's quite straightforward. If you've got two combat dice, then the chance of returning to the bag is thirty point five six percent. If you've got three dice, it's forty two point one three percent, and four is fifty one point seven seven percent chance of returning to the bag. So, you know, most characters in Strontium Dog, I think there's a few more of them in Judge Dread or Kill Five. But by and large, in fact, the only character in Stor- Strontium Dog from memory that is Kill 5 is Johnny Alpha. Durham Red can go to Kill 5 if she does a particular ability, but mostly everybody except Johnny Alpha has a 51.77% chance with Kill 4 of returning to the bag. So that's without them being wounded. After that, it's less than 50% chance of getting it back in the bag. Kill 5 is a 59.81% chance of returning to the bag. So even... You know, that's Judge Dredd is, is Kill 5 as well, same as Johnny Alpha. Um, so you've only got just shy of a 60% chance of returning that. Now, to do it every sing, now to do it several times in a turn, you know, somebody that's a Kill 5, to do it twice in a turn, so Johnny Alpha, Judge Dredd, 35%, 0.77%. So that shows you it can happen. Like, you can literally play right through the game, just constantly drawing star chips back out of the bag. In theory, you can do that. In practice, the probability isn't really on your side to do it. So I just thought it would be worth mentioning, particularly the the fact that cool four characters are it's you know it's smudging over fifty percent of the time they will return those chips to the bag. So I think it's always good to know that knowledge. I thought that might be handy for people to be aware of. It, it's it's all my eyes to be honest with you. See, you actually putting down the stats like that, um, because I <laughs> use it a lot, as you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's so many times, and majority of my guys is cool four, um, and my, my better guys, right? There's only a few that's cool five across this tournament. I use it loads, and I'm just lucky enough to pull it off. Yeah, I mean, I've done it as well. When, when you actually look at these stats, it's just over 50% for a, a cool four character attempting it. That's kind of mind-boggling, but see now that I know that... <laughs> <laughs> I'll maybe I'll maybe stop. Um, I'll maybe think definitely think twice yeah. about doing that way because um, I hope it's no jinx having that knowledge. But it's it's really. <laughs> well, I don't I, I don't want to change your way of playing either. But you know it's really you know for some reason I don't know what I was thinking. I was just thinking you know you know four dice ah a rope but it's like a one in six chance in each dice. So when you you think of it, of course. It's, to be, to be honest, it was only because I did a, a Google search on the, the internet. Thanks, Edward D. Collins. Um, <laughs> I found out how this probability stuff worked. Because in theory, you know, it depends. If, if you're thinking of it not the right way, you would think, I've got a one in six chance 
of rolling a special. So therefore, if I roll six dice, I've got a hundred percent chance of rolling a special. No, that's not the case. You, you've never got a hundred percent chance. You've got a high chance of rolling one at least. But uh, yeah, so it doesn't quite add. You would, you in theory, you would think that your chance of returning the, the chip to the bag kind of doubles with every dice that you roll, uh, or you know, adds another sixteen percent. But it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so yeah, you've also got to look at it. I, I do. I um, believe that there is a certain degree of luck that comes into everything and there are certain players that I've played with in the past like my good friend Ian um, he is one of the luckiest people at rolling like, one in six results for any game see the amount of games that I've played with him and oh you need to roll a six to go to that Ian you know and he rolls it at critical dramatic moments so much so that so many of my other players are like totally infuriated with him <laughs> because He's able to wiggle out, and funnily enough, in about 20, you'll see an excellent moment of that where one of his characters getting out of something um, in which you're like, I can't believe that, and then I had to stop myself thinking, <laughs> I can't actually believe it, it's Ian. <laughs> if it was anybody else, Ronnie it is. Um, there's just, like I say, there is some people who are naturally lucky when it comes to things, but having the statistics there is definitely brilliant because it, it's, it's making me already look at things in a whole new light especially for using that <laughs> <laughs> underneath this uh, on youtube I'll, I'll put the link to the i did an article about it so you can see and you can see also the the chance of success for successive um, returns in a, in a given turn so yeah for example if you tried to uh, for a, a kill four character um, to return the chip the star chip to the bag Six times in any one turn, they've got a one point nine two percent chance of doing that. Oh, <laughs> so that, hang about, that, hang about the close. <laughs> hang about the close. I'm going to go back and review some of the missions because I'm sure I've done that quite a few times, and and I'm like, my goodness, I, I've really pulled. I, I'm surprised. I'm shocking myself that I've been able to do that um, across the course of this. You played a lot, is is what I would say to that. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a lot aye, of starship aye. characters so yeah it's gonna it will happen and i mean i've done it as well i've went in rampages with with midden face before uh, which i love because i love midden face anyway but yeah it, it's great when it, it happens it's fairly demoralizing for your opponent particularly if they don't if they've loaded up with non-starship uh starship i have no got the option of doing it yeah exactly so probably the last thing i want to say in general strategy here was you know we we're talking earlier on about you were saying about checking the abilities and and uh, obviously saying about the arm of the cards and chicane of the cards one of the things i like to do before i play a game before i'm going to when i'm selecting my forces i think something that's really key you have to do is to have a look at your model stats Aye. and basically what i tend to do is break them down into three categories shooters brawlers or all-rounders so to do that you're obviously looking to see which is the dominant stat is it shoot is it fight of the two of those you've got to factor in what weapons you've got and the ranges and the bonuses or penalties that they receive so you do that so you can work out are they more suited to shooting or are they more suited to fighting in close quarters so the likes of wolf sternhammer for example is you know he's a close combat fighter and you'll see that reflected in his stats he's he's pretty easy to work that one out Johnny Alpha is really easy to work that out because he's a better he's better at shooting. So we will get into we've got another right. we'll have another two of these conversations and we will look at specific models and so on. But that's what I tend to do before I start. Obviously, a shooter you you want to get them in the cover with a nice open arc, fire away, plug away at guys as they're at the opposite end of the battlefield. Brawlers, you want to be using that sprint action like we were talking about earlier on. Try and get them in, as I say, try and use the cover if you can. Ideally, keep them out of sight of enemy units with their shooters. But if not, get them at least touching cover so you get the plus two resist as well as the minus one for them to shoot at you. The all-rounders then become situational. And to be honest, an all-rounder, my personal preference would be to keep guys at range. Unless they're all really good shooters, basically, then I might be tempted to move my all-rounders closer into engaging them in close combat. But basically, I think the, the game is... This maybe comes back to what you were saying earlier. You've not really used the brawler skill that much. It, it really is a game that's much more about shooting combat than it is uh, brawling. And I think that is part of the problem with Wolf's character, I suppose. And just, By the way, I'm not. this isn't a criticism of the rules, by the way. It's, I think... Wolf has started exactly how he should be, and I like the fact he's got that uh, berserker rule, which means he can ignore the first wound. Well, he still carries it, 
but he doesn't get the penalties for it and that. So in other words, if you get three wins with, on Wolf, he's only going to get stat loss for two of them. But one of the problems with him is the system is, is such that it's kind of harder to get into close combat. So you you really want to be charging Wolf in the same in mid and face. He's also much better at close combat than he is shooting. So those, those characters sometimes struggle a wee bit, I think, compared to the likes of, you know, Johnny Alford or Max Bubba would be a good example where he's a good shooter and he's got that he's even better because he's got that blazooka but that's for a future episode so I don't know if you do the same thing Alan do you kind of think that way as well well what I've noticed is you know if you've got a table that you're playing you've got to always make sure you've got sufficient cover you know if you're fielding brawler uh, close combat type characters because if they have not got you've not got sufficient cover on the board then more often than not they're gunned down yeah. because as you say it is mainly the game is set you know for gunfighting not just the, the ability for actual raised weaponry mm -hmm. and because what you've also got to remember is it's one thing getting your getting a character touching cover but the only time you get the benefit for heavy cover is if your opponent who's shooting at you their line of sight crosses the heavy cover yeah so there's sometimes you might you might know if you've not got enough cover on the ground you might not be able to get to the right angle to your enemy. Yeah. So you might be in, you might have reached the cover your base might be touching it but they might be shooting at you for an angle in which the cover has got nothing it's not going to block their line of sight in any way so then you're not going to get the benefit at all. It's something to if you're fielding models do a fair table set up a fair table an agreement with your opponent that look, to be able to see the benefits of these characters, you've got to have sufficient cover. Now, having said that, you know, I, I've played games where oh, Ian's played Wolf and uh, the Wolf character for using a combination of charge actions, basic fight actions, and also I think it's a chicanery card called Charge. Mm. I think it's called Charge, which allows you uh, a free charge action. And also if you have the brawler skill, you're able to re-roll any misses. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have their cards, Wolf's a, Wolf's a devastating character. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but again, you've got to utilise cover to be able to allow you to get close enough to a target to do this. Because if you don't, then the chances are you're going to get chipped doing. Having the Berserker is fantastic. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it only helps you so much. So eventually you're going to go down if enough people are targeting you. You know, so... You've got to be very, very cautious when you're using the charge action if it's going to take you out, expose your character in any, in any way. So that's the one tip that I would say. Just make sure that you're you're having enough cover, potential with cover on the board, so you're not no short sell when you're a close combat specialist. Yeah. But again, that's that's up to you when you're setting up, you and your opponent when you're setting up the table. Um, and thankfully, it's never really come up in my games because my games is... It's all about a lot of scenery. You know, I, I put a lot of scenery into it because I want to showcase a lot of scenery and I want it, want it to be thematic. But it, it would be easy sometimes for people just to fire together a, a board and have it like desert, no enough scenery, you know? Yeah. Well, well I think the way um, round that is if both players agree to take a certain amount of close combat specialists and then it's a bit fairer, I suppose. But I'm not trying to throw it a lot of shade at the way Wolf set up as a character. I'm just saying that I feel the system is more balanced towards long range uh, fighting rather than close quarters. Yeah, definitely. But yes, I have absolutely had Wolf do brilliantly in in some scenarios. So it's not the case that I think he's rubbish. Far from it. Actually, he's he's, he's actually really durable, and uh, he's very handy. I think he works great with uh, Johnny Alpha. But yeah, again, we'll come back to that in a, in a future episode. So. I think that really covers our kind of general tips for, for playing Strontium Dog. And as I say, if you're playing Judge Dredd, that will equally apply. Obviously, coming up, regular visitors to the YouTube channel will obviously be aware of Alan's work on The Killing. Um, so he's been recording, we've done 16 bouts so far. Yeah. And we did a, a kind of greatest hits episode, I suppose, Sorry. a recap of the series so far, just before Christmas. And the series will be returning be a week's time after this is goes live. So this is the seventh of January and it'll be the fourteenth of January that the next step next bout of the killing is on the way. For them that's not seen it, Alan's basically recreating the strip uh, for me really, really well. I'm I'm just gonna say this because <laughs> um that I think, you know, you've captured the spirit of this, this strip. I love the fact that you've got all the kind of uh, captions and speech bubbles and 
the characters are speaking the way that they do in the strip. So if you're a 2000 AD fan, and particularly if you're a Strontium Dog fan, I really think you should check out these episodes and, and see what Alan's done, because I think it's fairly unique. I've not seen something like this before, and I think it's really... The, the other thing, the other strength of the series for me is obviously you're not seeing the same characters all the time. Every bout has different characters. Some, yes, some characters get through a bout and they get through it the next round. But you will see some of them recurring, um, but it's not the same by you know by a long shot every single every single round and the other thing for me that i think is really strong about it is the amount of variety that you've got in your terrain that it's making each bout for me as a my role in this if, if you like is basically all i do is you give me the pictures and um and i basically stitch them into a video and host them on my channel if you had a channel they would be there as well and uh, just in case people are thinking i'm nicking all your stuff for myself um <laughs> I suppose I am, but <laughs> the same the same uh, token they would be on your YouTube channel if you had one, and it was that was one of the things I was keen for you to do. But uh, I said, okay, I'll do it if you're not going to do it. <laughs> no, I've no. Maybe at some maybe at some point in the future I'll get to do it. But uh, you're doing a fantastic job that side of it anyway. So Thanks. the way I see it, it's like a kind of joint effort to actually get this this out there. I mean. It, when you're even talking about putting together, I like to think these is glorified comics. That's kind of what they are. We're we are trying to do the writer, the artist, and the letterer here, but do it in a kind of video format. So for ease of consumption, just sit back, put it on their big screen telly, and just sit and, and be able to watch these play out. But essentially, they are part game guide, and but mainly story-driven narrative. And I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And as you say, it's it's sometimes it's been quite a challenge making sure that they're all different. But um, so far, and to be honest with you, everything's mapped out. As you know, Gordon, I've already played up to about about twenty seven. There's thirty two bouts all in. A wee spoiler for you, uh, but I've already played up to about twenty seven. I've only got about, in fact, I think I've only got about four. A couple of them has been played out of order, but I've only got about four or five bouts left to actually play. So obviously it takes a while to edit all them together. But I can honestly say that every single one of them has been different. And the path that the storyline's taken here, even though I, I knew the the basic path that it was going to go, has been enhanced by the performances, the unpredictable performances of some of the, the characters in, in the games, which has led to great moments, which will build up to a fitting finale. So um, <laughs> I'm going to have sure uh, so I'm going to have a lot of fun putting them together, and I've recently finished the the vast majority of my scenery for the city. So the final eight bouts will take place in the city. So you'll see some interesting TT combat scenery put to good uh, use there. So it's I've got some pretty good stuff coming up, and uh, again every every one of them different things like uh, uptown, downtown. So you've got like uh, train monorails. Posh buildings, kind of slum buildings. Obviously, for downtown, uptown's a kind of posher buildings. I've got like a, a dock, a bridge section. So, a lot of unique stuff and some pretty unique hazards which can come up as well. So, it's a lot of fun to do, but um, it'll be something that hopefully, when I look back in it, and fans will appreciate it. Not just fans, you said fans of the game, fans of the strip in general, because I'm a massive Strontium Dog fan because I, I, I do like Strontium Dog role plays and stuff, so I've got a lot of knowledge in the, the subject. So I'm trying to put it all to good use and something that will go the test of time, stand the test of time and go the distance, you know. So um, so hopefully people will appreciate it and it's giving people enjoyment anyway because I'm enjoying it myself. Definitely is for me anyway. It's, I always enjoy putting them together and yeah, seeing what happens because I, I try not to... I, I basically take all the pictures and put them in a timeline and then... By the end of it, you don't want it spoiled. I, I don't want. I, I try. Not, I try not to look at any of it. I try to just look at it in order. Well, I do edit it in order once it's dumped in the timeline. But yeah, so it's it's always good fun trying to uh, guess who it's going to where it's going to go. Another thing, just to mention, is that you're pretty religious about the dice rolls. So, yep. Spoiler alert: if you haven't watched the earlier bouts, but a, a major character was killed off, and yeah, that was a, a shocker for me. Um, so. That does prove that you do honour the, the dice gods, as it were, so that means nobody is safe. <laughs> it is. It's got, I've got to do it. 
Aye, and nobody is safe uh, as in, in any creative endeavour that I'd go out and when fate and luck's involved, I think it can add an extra element which gives your work credence. Uh, see if you've got a, a, an element of unpredictability, which I employ a lot in my own novels as well. It's, you know, there's loads of sequences in, in my novels in which I feel there's a character here which isn't the imperative to the plot, that is maybe a, a background character. Somebody's got to die because the drama is dictating it um, and sometimes I've just rolled a dice and the, the result of that death shocks me as the creator as much as hopefully it will shock any reader and this is that in spades, this tournament is that in spades because there's moments when I'm playing this game through and that, for example, that character you mentioned there, no spoilers, I'll not say their names, but everything went wrong for that character at that time. And that character is, you know, they're not a pushover. It's not as if they're weak, they're a good character. Yeah. But it just shows that if you, the dice gods are not with you, you can go. And I was gutted when they think the, the dice rolls were getting made. But then I thought, well, we'll take the drama that that is going to bring from that is great. So it's improved the flow of the story as well for how it's went. And there's loads of wee moments like that I found where the performance of certain characters is embellished the characters in the story. And it, we're at a stage now where it's not just Johnny Alpha is the main guy in this. It's no Johnny Alpha. There's like a core cast, about six or seven potential fighters who are becoming like the predominant characters. And it's purely because they're deserving it because they are putting in through luck, through the dice rolls or through their own actions, uh, how they've been getting played. They are becoming the main protagonists and it's fantastic because it means as the playing field is levelled and slowly but surely the guys is whittled down these guys are inevitably going to clash and that's what, what I'm finding exciting and I can tell you the, the now because I'm so far ahead there is some epic clash moments in which me as the player is playing this out I genuinely didn't know who I was wanting to win <laughs> because there's favourite guys going head to head you know, obviously there's times of alliances where temporary alliances can be can be formed. But um, what I'm loving is uh, it's just I don't know where this is. I know where it's going, but I don't know where that result's going to be. <laughs> Who's going to be the one who stands for him? And then also it leads right into the the epilogue. You know, so once we get to the end of the tournament, there's a wee epilogue to tie tie everything up, so that it's all complete as a story, which I'm really going to have fun with. <laughs> I'll be using a lot of I mean, let's just say there's some old foundry miniatures getting put into play at the end. The old you know, the old uh, two thousand range of foundry. Yeah. Which I bought years ago and I thought I could use them. I used to use them in my role plays, but I'll put them to good use and they'll, they'll feature good on the board in the, the epilogue scenes, you know. So and I'm having a lot of fun doing the see the bridging sequences as well, the interludes. Mm -hmm. Because that's mainly story driven. So there'll be another one of them coming up as well to bridge. Uh, that's after the next eight bouts. Then there'll be one of them, the interlude, and then there'll be the final eight, and then there'll be the epilogue section. So you're talking about a lot of work there, but I think it will. I'm actually looking forward to watching it all again. <laughs> you know, maybe I need to get a life, but you know, it's actually. <laughs> I think I worked it out recently, um, and it's going to be longer than the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings put together, so that's quite an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> so you think about it, because it, most of the videos, you know, a lot of the, the later videos are hard and fast, and you're talking about it's like maybe 20 minutes still. I think they'll work in at about 20 minutes. Uh, but there is a couple that are epic, but you've got to have the epic ones because to curtail them, you would lose the impact. Yeah, exactly. And it shows you the game in its, its full flow and performing at its best as well, I think. Um, to be honest, I, the ones I, I like best are the kind of slightly longer ones as well, where it's, it feels like there's um, sometimes there's kind of a bit more ebb and flow and stuff. If they're over quite quickly, it's usually fairly one character's kind of dominating quite quick. Aye. And that's just the way the dice rolls go. That's not a criticism, by the way. That's just the way. It, for me, the ones that I like are the uh, tend to be the kind of real epic ones because you don't know one side's kind of doing well and then suddenly the, the chicanery cards or the a, a few good dice rolls can change the whole thing, you know. So that's the fun of it. So, but no, that, to be honest, I enjoy every one that you send in, and it's good fun for me to edit them all. So uh, yeah, see, I just love the see the ones where you can see a story taking place unfolding before your eyes because obviously when I put these together, it's just a bunch of Photographs, tactics, dice rolls, but then when I've when I'm actually putting them together into a, a story, that's when a lot of the dialogue comes to life. There's sometimes when I'm shooting it and I'm thinking, oh, I can do some. The viewers will only know this until they actually see it. But see the moment with the wife front character. See the character that the wife front. <laughs> <laughs> See what it, yeah. you know what I'm talking about here, Gordon. But that character, when I seen that that model in that, I thought, 
oh, this is a potential for a good wee bit of banter here going on between the other character. But again, that was something that I never planned. That's something when I was shooting it, I thought I could put that wee section in. And obviously, the dice were rolled, the shot was made, that was made in the actual story and in, in the actual bout itself. But um, when I was actually putting it together and coming up with the text that the, the, the character was going to say about to the other character, the, the wife fronts on, I thought that flowed pretty good. And it's a good character moment for, for that character as well. So that's what I enjoy. I enjoy the kind of storytelling process when I'm able to put it together. What I don't enjoy so much is some of the special effects that I've made it, that I've got to do, you know, um, even though it's I've got to do it now because I'm committed to it. It's like some of it is very, very difficult to put together. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that because I can see you. I mean, I think you've created a rod for your back, but <laughs> I, uh, I, at the same time, the, the, the one uh, for them that's not really noticed this before, the the one with the gorge with Durham Red and the Gronk was one that really stood out at me. Where it was I like know. a it was a rope bridge, and you basically photoshopped in, you know, at, at the gorge beneath in the the jungle that was there. So it was it was visually incredible, but it was one of those things. I was, you know. I, I actually tested this out with somebody else and asked them, "Do you notice any effects here?" And they, and they didn't. They didn't realise what it was, like what you'd done. I said, "Look, he's done it, and this, he's done." It. And it's like every, it's so many pictures. So yeah, I take my hat off to you because I just didn't have the patience. I don't have the Photoshop skills, first of all, but secondly, I wouldn't have the patience to do it. So you see, when I, I ne never planned that when I was shooting that one initially, but it was when once I'd done it, I thought, you know what. That would look better with a gorge. And see if I'd thought of that beforehand and I'd planned it, there would have been a lot of the angles of the pictures that I could have taken and that I could have cut out the need to actually superimpose in any gorge there. You'll have like a few kind of money shot gorge shots, which to be said, and obviously when characters are on the rope bridge, I've got to do it then. But there's certain other angles when characters was, was on the walkways, you know, the actual rocky walkways. And I've shot it for an angle because I've not planned it right. And I'm thinking, oh, God... That's gave me myself all that work. Having said that, that's one of the ones I'm proudest of because I, I went the distance with that one and I thought, this does really raise the bar on this. And because of that, my forward planning was the same. Just be careful how you're shooting certain angles. But again, I fell foul with that, the one coming up with the shopping mall with the mosaic floor because obviously there's a kind of, it's a gridded floor a kind of a fancy mosaic on it and uh, for all the shots where there was characters getting off then I, I always remove the dice if it's a death shot of a character the final shot I'll remove the actual base from them but see trying to get that it's just some semblance that looked alright it still doesn't look perfect but it looks no bad uh, but it's like because obviously you know what I'm talking about characters getting shot and there, there's no base they've got no base some people might think I actually remove the characters for the base. No, I don't. I digitally remove them and use the clone tool in Photoshop to put the background, you know, where the base was. It's quite difficult. It's all right if you're doing it if it's a desert. You know what? Then all you do is you basically uh, put a masking tool around the character's feet and you basically just clone the surrounding desert terrain over the base. But not when there's a pattern on an actual mosaic floor. <laughs> that is something else entirely. And it's... Uh, but it's all these wee things that as a creator, I've got to do it my best that I can because at the end of the day, I'm hoping this is going to stand the test of time. I'm hoping it's going to be up there for as long as the two years want it to be up there, um, which in my, my mind is forever. <laughs> so, um, no, mine, mine as well. My, this channel's going nowhere. <laughs> and it's, aye, it's going to be there forever. And it's a, it's a great thing to have, to have the privilege of, uh, of hosting, to be honest with you. One of the other effects, just to mention before we, we wrap up here, is the uh, time bomb is is one of my one of my favourite ones. I, I love that. <laughs> oh, love it. Aye. That is a again that was a eureka moment. At first, I was thinking right, I was going to have to superimpose the the character and whatever scenery is taken along with them into space. I was going to have to superimpose that into a like a space scene which I suppose I could have done, but then I thought, you know what, I just started looking for mouse mats, bizarrely, of the Earth, of the Earth orbit, and I found an absolutely cracking mouse mat, which looks phenomenal, and I just shoot it for a certain angle, but I can put the actual character on top of the mouse mat and angle it, so you, sometimes you see shadow, sometimes you don't, so that you don't really see a shadow, and then it takes minimal work. Sometimes what I've got to do is, I think kidneys... Say it was difficult to do because I had to uh, do a lot of the clone tool so that the ground, that he, the section of ground that was taken with him and taken into space, I had to kind of 
do a lot of effects with that. But the worst one by far was the two prisoners getting taken out in the, the outpost one with Clacton Fuzz and the Creeler and Dumazel and that. It's a, a very memorable scene, but that segment was a nightmare because where it happened, there was a corridor, so I had to cut out chunks of the wall, all digitally, using the clone tool. And then I had to put, again using the clone tool, the rooms that were revealed by the blast of the time bomb, like there's a mosaic floor, a kind of black and white kind of square tile floor for the mess hall in the, the actual... It was revealed, so I had to, I had to do that. I, don't, I didn't even notice that. So, so there's things I'm Aye. I'm editing the thing, and I'm there's things I'm missing as well. Where you're, that's that's how integrated it is, though, that you've managed to that somebody that's actually sitting scrutinising every single picture uh, didn't notice. <laughs> it's one of the ones where, see, if I was to show you the raw footage for for that whole section with the, the prisoners dying and, and uh, the the time bomb, because after there's there's fight with um, other characters dying in that section, but I still had to do the time bomb effect of the remaining the remains of the corridor in the room um, around the characters that were then dying on top of that. That oh, that was a real challenge. But it's one again the the gorge one. It's one of the proudest when I look back in it. I'm like, that's brilliant, and that's I think that'd been one of your personal favourites. I think because of how that flowed as well there was a lot of fighting and nobody really wanted to die in that it was like <laughs> so one character would fight get wounded they would get away they would come back they would you know there was a lot of good uh, basically examples of the the way that the game's played and different things that happen in the game rather than just a character getting shot always wounds taken he's dead you know this was it was great um interactions between characters story wise as well as chronicling the rules and i thought um it's one of my favourites as well. But, you see, because I'm making loads of them different, I think the one is one of my favourites, and then I think, oh, no, but I like that one as well, or there's ones where I think, oh, quite generic, but there was good moments in it, you know, there was key elements in it, and I've got some absolutely brilliant ones, which I've no way edited with the special effects together, but the ones I know that once I get the special effects down, they're going to be, be absolutely brilliant, um, look brilliant on the screen. One other thing to say, um, if anybody who's wanting to watch these that hasn't watched them yet, I really recommend you getting a cup of tea or a beverage of your choice and just sitting back and watching them on a big screen. If you can watch them through your telly, YouTube and your telly, if you can do that, you'll appreciate them. I feel a lot better because you're sitting there, comfort of your own home. You're not watching them, trying to scrutinise text on a phone. You can watch them like that if, if you, you wish, but they're much better just sitting back and watching the bouts through YouTube on your telly. That's how I personally enjoy them. Once Gordon's put together the video, I actually get quite excited. It's normally he'll tell me in the uh, normally on a Friday, going to be up, and he'll send me a rough cut, and I will sit and watch it through the through the computer first. But see when he's actually got it ready to go up, I love just sitting watching them <laughs> for the first time that it's actually out for the public to see. I always watch them through the big big telly. Sometimes I, I still notice text errors which bugs me <laughs> of course <laughs> oh there's so um, much but, it's, it's, it's always going to happen uh, there's so much to take and because I've got to edit everything as well as uh, you know you're, and it's wee silly things I'm like ah oh, it's a semicolon in the ring <laughs> <laughs> but anyway a lot of people wouldn't even notice them but um, it's still it's perfectly you can just sit there and you just digest it you able to digest it viewing it on the big screen a lot better than what you would just watching it on a wee phone so um but if people are able to watch this and enjoy it, great. It's particularly in the midst of all this pandemic. I know it's helped keep me going because I've had to sacrifice a lot of my personal time not being able to go anywhere because of this situation. But if it's gained people a wee bit of enjoyment and they're actually looking forward to these going up, then that's a result. That's brilliant because it's given them something to look forward to, you know? No, absolutely. Just to add to that, the, the uh, all these videos, in fact, I think I do it well, the videos, unless it's podcast ones, on the YouTube cha channel, everything's 1080p, so it is HD ready. It does stand up easily to that, because I've done it myself on the 42-inch, um, watched some of them. So, absolutely. Yeah, go for the real widescreen effect. <laughs> anyway, I think we better tie up there. Yep. And uh, so thanks for joining me to talk about this. As I say, we'll maybe do another two. Next time we'll maybe, we'll either talk about, we want to talk about, specifically about the, the different characters in the game, the Strutting Dog agents themselves and also the outlaws. 
So we'll maybe do another one in the next break. You said it's another eight episodes, didn't you, Alan? Uh, there's eight episodes. This is set in the suburbs. The city limits in the kind of suburb area before the the city. And then there'll be, obviously, uh, another interlude. So it'd be ideal to do one of these before that. And then there'll be the, the final eight, which is set in the city itself. So we can maybe do another one. Aye, after that. Aye, after that. Before the, maybe before the epilogue or something. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining me talking about it. It was uh, great to get your thoughts and tactics and uh, ah, hear what's coming. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, I'll let you go now, Alan. Um, so for everybody listen, thanks for, if you still are at this point, <laughs> 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 um, listen, as what on. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. And uh, until next time, keep on living the life of die.